I would like to welcome our actually great guest, you know, Krzysztof Zanosin, a great director. But mostly, uh, don't be afraid, this is not only talking about the movies. This is also because Krzysztof is for me only, not only the filmmakers, but very experienced man. So if you would like to discuss any issues, or to listen to stories from the traveling and from the life, very great man. Here, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. And I hope if you will sit even closer to this person, you will actually recognize that this is true. So please enjoy this possibility. No worries, we are definitely relaxing here more now this moment. Not so much working, the festival is almost uh, finished. So enjoy this possibility and I'm happy that you are here with us. And Krishna, please, it's... Well, thank you very much for this kind introduction. I have a microphone, so I can speak not very loud. I'm very happy that you found time to to stay with me for a moment. I'm not discouraged by no means that you're not that, that numerous because numbers count only at the box office, but not in the scale of values. Sometimes one person is sufficient justification for all the effort we do. So I'm very pleased and flattered that you've chosen for this afternoon this meeting. I would call it a meeting because can be a regular masterclass. I have some fragments of films which I will show you just to illustrate what I'm talking about, mostly because I want to entertain you. But supposing that you're either filmmakers or people close to filmmaking, I would like to start with some autobiographical remarks that I hope evoke some universal questions. I am Polish, however, of Italian instruction, and I bear Italian name. And some people are always, some people are embarrassed to ask if I have anything to do with refrigerators and washing machines. The answer is yes. These are my remote cousins from Italy, and we have very good relationship and I would say sort of friendship. So it is just coincidence that my part of family moved to Austria, to Habsburg Empire, from North Italy that was part of Habsburg Empire, and to Poland, which was also part of Habsburg Empire. Of course, they had to cross Bohemia, which was also Habsburg Empire. So we were all in Central Europe somehow interrelated. And I'm very aware of that. And I think it's the great beauty of Central Europe that we are all close to each other. When I evoke my Italian, my Italian relatives, I'm always tempted to tell you a story, which is a real story. Being a Polish film director, you can imagine that I was always feeling that I am a poor cousin from far away. And my multi-millionaire cousins in Italy, in Pordenone, whatever I tried to express, I always felt I am a poor cousin. However, I was active in the most beautiful domain, which is filmmaking. And I thought, I am the lucky one, because they are making refrigerators and dishwashing machines, and I am making films. So I'm talking about emotions, about passion, about something that is deeply human. And of course, the refrigerator has also a human aspect, but it's not very big. Film is bigger. So I felt maybe I have better luck. At the same time, materially, as a Polish, communist Polish passport, uh, passport holder, I was a very poor person. And my Italian relatives, were fabulously rich. They owned their own plane. One of the plane crashed at Lino Zanussi, one of my cousins died in Pyrenees. But altogether, it was a fantastic contrast. And you know, contrast makes always a good drama. So whenever I was, I was meeting my relatives, I felt this tension because they couldn't assess me, I couldn't assess them. 
They were always wondering, they were even wondering now, why an old man as I am, 73, why do I work so much? I can retire. Of course, materially, I can retire, but I don't want to retire. I fight not to retire because it's a great passion to make films. So, this is the mechanism. And one little anecdote of our relationship. I always wanted to impress them because they were impressing me a lot. And in 1980, I had this opportunity to have my film, Polish film, The Contract, as a closing film of Venice Film Festival. So it was a great honor, film was not in competition, but it was a closing film chosen by them, by the festival. And I took my Italian cousin to be with me, and I knew that next to us will be seated the Prime Minister of Italy, Mr. Giulio Andreotti, one of the pillars of European politics. And there will be Federico Fellini among the audience, because it's a close friend. And I knew that this is a chance for me to impress my Italian relatives who are making refrigerators. And Guido Zanussi, my closest relative, one generation senior to me, he sat next to the Prime Minister, next to me, and the film was very well received. I got great applauses, so I thought, my God, this is the most I can achieve in my life. And I noticed that in spite of 10 minutes standing ovation, my Italian cousin is not impressed at all. So I understood nothing would impress him ever, because even if I got an Oscar, it wouldn't be any more. And I was very upset, I realized we are worlds apart. But next morning, at the Hotel Lido, Hotel Le Bain, I was a guest of the festival, I could never afford this hotel even now, and he was there because he was very rich. We had breakfast together. And he greets me at breakfast and says, Christoph, I never, I never thought how big you are. I said, my God, Guido, you were yesterday with me. You have seen people applauding. He says, I don't care about applauses. Whenever I enter our factory, the workers are always applauding me. So that's normal. That's usual. But I've seen our name on the front pages of many papers all around Italy. Do you know what is the price of one square centimeter on the front page? And you didn't pay for it, so you must be big. And that's how my Italian cousins realized that I'm somebody for them. Not a big achievement. Anyway, this was my little victory. Never a bigger one, but I mention it because this contrast of wealth and pride is something very typical for our relationship, East-West relationship, and our experience of glory and no money. And their experience of money and no glory is quite typical. So I just mention it because I thought this will be a good introduction of myself. I am, because of my first studies, I am a physicist that has fallen into cinema. But my first field was physics. I'm very proud of it. It was a very good choice in 1955 when I graduated from the high school. I joined the university and physics was the only, physics, mathematics, and chemistry were the only clean disciplines I could have chosen. My family generations were constructors and architects. And of course my father wanted me to be an architect. But it was time of socialist realism. So these monstrous constructions in Stalinist style were projected by, were designed by the architects at the time. And my father was explaining to me every day how poor taste it is. So I thought, what am I going to do? 
poor taste and I will do the same thing myself as a no. And I decided physics is pure, it deals with the matter, and even Soviet ideology did not contaminate physics. My personal problem with physics is very simple. I'm in love with physics even today, but physics was never in love with me. So, better abandon. After four years of efforts, I realized I will never seduce physics. And I was a little bit better than mediocre, but I was never excellent. And as a lonely only child, surviving the war, I thought that this one thing I care for, I must be excellent in something. So, I switched to philosophy. I studied philosophy in Krakow from 1960. And it was, or Czechs were present here, it is something to be reminded that in Krakow, after the thaw that Khrushchev started after 56, we had a regular class of philosophy with non-Marxist philosophy of the state university. It was a total exception in the whole Soviet bloc. We had it, and I was taught by the pupil of Husserl, and it was a regular philosophy class Marxism was marginal. However, I knew I'm not going to be a professional philosopher. I studied, I've studied for, for three years. And in the meantime, as many students, I was doing hundreds of things, writing reviews, creating student papers. I was involved in student theaters, directing, writing, performing. I was not never a good performer. Anyway, I was trying many things because I felt I haven't found my way yet. And among other things, I was making amateur films, just for fun, with other students. And these films suddenly were winning prizes. You know, for a young man, it is crucial to get confirmation that what he does is fine, that somebody objectively tells you you are good in what you are doing. Because maybe men more than women were full of doubts and we never really believe in ourselves unless somebody tells us you are good. So I've heard I'm good making short amateur films in one of the national yearly national competitions for amateur films. Out of ten prizes, I won seven. It was anonymous. Nobody knew that all these films were mine. So I thought, well, my God, if I'm getting seven prizes, I must be good. And I decided I would apply to the Film Academy. And I was admitted. So it was a great victory, because it was not easy to be admitted. And after three years, I was kicked out. So everything was somehow symmetrical. Easy beginning, easy end. My professors didn't like what I was doing, but finally I had given up fighting and I decided if I want to be a filmmaker, I have to be humble and reapply. And I reapplied to the Film Academy and they allowed me to finish my studies. So that was my story. I finished my studies in the Film Academy in Łódź with my diploma film, The Death of the Father Provincial, and it was a film which was set in the monastery, what was for that time, 66, something very unheard of. And the Academy, when they had seen my film, they realized that they allowed me to make something, to make something what is ideologically dubious. Because all the film is a story of a young student who is, we suppose, an architect or a art historian, and he is in the monastery because he is in charge of some architectural documentation. So he is taking pictures and measurements of the architecture in the monastery. But he is surrounded by people who, have, who don't speak because it is a severe monastery when the monks are silent. The truth behind the script is very simple. I wanted to make a realistic story, and in Polish in particular, dubbing is very ineffective or ineffective. 
Our language is extremely monotonous. We have very complicated grammar. But we don't dub films for general public. People hate dubbing because it sounds like theater play. In life, we have very monotonous intonations and only by grammar you understand is this a question or not. We don't sing like Russians or British or French or Germans. They are for us far more theatrical in their way of speaking. Also, if I speak English, I am far more theatrical than I am in my Polish. If you hear me in Polish, I am, everything is on one tone. Because that's the nature of the language. That's why dubbing was never commercially popular in Poland. And I did one of my films and post synced with it, and it was a disaster. So I decided for my diploma, if I wanted to be realistic, let it be not spoken. And the whole relationship in the monastery is based on the glimpse, on the moments of silence, one is watching another. Nothing happens except that between young man and a very old monk, there is some link, they observe each other, they feel some mutual attraction. It's not a sexual attraction because the old man is very old, but he's about to die. And in the last moment of the film, this half an hour feature, at the last moment, old man wants to say something. But when he wants to say something, it is too late. Thank you very much for the light. We have changing weather. And in a moment I will be screening something for you because I don't want to talk all the time. It will be boring. Would have been boring. Well, so I mentioned my diploma film because my diploma film has a very has a has a story, has a history which in a way you would say is instructive to be reminded. My professors, when the film was done, noticed that maybe it is ideologically not correct to have a film that plays in the, in the monastery. This monastery is something not progressive. And my dean, who was a very experienced man, said, well, when it happened, we approved the script. The only thing we can do is to make two prints. And they sent one print to Moscow, to the festival, Komsomol festival, for the young filmmakers, and the other print was sent parallelly to Mannheim, Western Germany festival. And in one week, I got two prizes. Komsomol gave me the prize for of atheists, and Protestants and Catholics in Mannheim gave me a golden medal of for Christians. What was the proof that once you have no dialogue? People cannot judge your work, they have no idea what it is. And it was a good lesson. Unfortunately, later I was using more dialogue, but I know that the best cinema is without the word, words. And because I evoke a very, very distant time, I want to show you at the beginning something very short, six minutes, out of three of my films, early films, because, you know, the time is running and the old prints tend to, to vanish. And because our prints, the color vanishes, even if we were shooting on Kodak, is not Kodak negative, this negative is not forever. Up to now, we believe that black and white negative is forever at least Lumiere film, you can still check the original negative, it is okay. But color is vanishing. So fortunately now, in my country and in many other countries, we started a program, it's a governmental program, of reconstructing old films and making new prints so that they look, and the authors, the directors, the directors of photography, the sound uh, director, the sound uh, mixers are present. And you can do it again because it, it has different colors now. We have to find a different scale of colors because on digital it is always different. But it's good to see how big this effect is. 
So as we have in Poland, we are a rather poor country, and we already have 100 films which are considered classics, uh, reconstructed digitally. Now I think what I can show you of my different works, just to entertain you and to have some reflection that may be useful for you, I wonder what can be useful. But I thought I would show you one of my shortest films I've done recently. I usually show it on the master classes when I try to talk to, talk to people about drama, dramatic tension, ba the basis, basic element of storytelling. Because in our days there is a lot of confusion. And I think the standards of storytelling went down because of the proliferation of stories and proliferation due to the TV serials. And TV serials, I mean by serial what Americans call whatever has no end, open end. These films which are shot in 1,400 episodes and which are continued as long as there is an audience. These stories, in my understanding, are far more destructive to our mind than people expect. Because they break with our great tradition of Greek drama, of Greek tragedy, that taught us a certain way that helps us to understand our life and our existence. This Greek tragedy has prologue, has the beginning, has climax, and has resolution, sometimes epilogue. And it is like the day with the sunrise up to the sunset with sun and noon in the, in the middle. This is the way we often see our life. It has been deeply imprinted in our culture. And whenever I lecture in other, on other continents, I realize that this vision of life is alien to the Chinese and Indians. It is alien to Arabs. They have different ways and patterns of telling stories. And their patterns are also interesting. However, nobody can beat Shakespeare. No other civilization created such a narrative art that we have today. And that's why our narrative art is influencing and dominating the rest of the world. But it was always based on this premise that there are knots of life, that something in life is decisive, maybe one day, maybe one night, maybe one moment of the climax, we take right or wrong decision, and the rest, well, in Hamlet we say rest is the silence, but rest is the epilogue, the rest is irrelevant. We lost our life chance, or we won our life chance, and that's forever. And now look at the series. The one thing they must do, and every serial writer knows it, is to make everything equal because every episode must be the same in terms of dramatic tension. So somebody dies, somebody is born, one has divorced, one has married. All is like chopped, like chopped meat in the machine. There is no sense in life anymore. There is just consequence, not sense. One thing happens after another. And I think this kind of narrative doesn't do any wrong when it talks about everyday life, about the fact that I lost my keys and I forgot to make a call and I lost my portfolio but I found it next day. When I'm on this level, this everyday life that was the beginning of soap opera was absolutely legitimate. But today, when we try to tell real serious stories in endless episodes, it is a real destruction of our consciousness. 
and I am very, very worried about it. However, such things appear and disappear, maybe serials will slowly disappear, because I think they really fool the audience. They give them a foolish vision of life, where everything is the same. There is no particular moment and particular decision. So whenever I meet my students, I try to tell them, don't watch that much television. Watch something better than television serials. And whenever I show, I see their works, and I recognize they show me something what is not their experience, it is just what I have seen on television. So they are reproducing something that was already produced. So it is second hand, so it is not original. I remember I was having a class in Houston, Texas. Very good, Rice University, very bright students. But I've seen their works and they were very disappointing because they were mostly showing something that I've already seen on television. So I tried to appeal, saying, please, tell me your real stories, your hesitations, your decisions. This will be more interesting. And one student rose his hand and said, Professor, but I had only one real dilemma in my life. What was it, I asked. He said, you know, I had to choose between buying Nokia or Motorola. Well, he said, if you are aware how miserable your choices are, this is already a story. But tell me about it and tell me with the same ironic smile that you have now that your life has been reduced to such unimportant choices. Because all our choices are important, because our life is important. So I would like to insist that you must have a dramatic conflict in your story. If there is no dramatic conflict, there is no story. And in life, we have permanent drama. And in my long experience, I've made over 40 feature films, and most of them I've written. And most of them are inspired by real facts, but something I've heard about. And every day I am collecting some new story. Almost every trip is a new story. Somebody tells me something, and I know it can be transformed, and in a new form, maybe it will be a story. So, altogether, I think that if we lose touch with life, we are not artists anymore. But that's a general observation. One of my latest films, which is a French, uh, Italian-French co-production, called in English The Black Sun, Soleneo. It is a film based on a stage play written by a friend of mine in Italy, a writer, Rocco Familiari. We are almost the same age, we are friends, and I put on stage two other plays of him, and then there was a chance to make this film for cinema. It is based on the stage play, I had to write it new because it is all written for one interior, and in the film I, I needed more action, more space. I don't want to present you the film as such, I want to present you the co-production with powerful studios. Because it was remarkable that I was given a chance, first time in my life, to have a huge set built in the studio, but bigger than I needed. I needed practically one room. I got whole city instead. These are the secrets of production. We never know why sometimes somebody wants to spend more money than necessary. And it's not none of my business. It was not a co-producer of this film. So it was okay with me. But I think I got the most beautiful set ever built for me. I had many sets in the past built in Poland, but not such a big one. And it matches with the real architecture 
in the city of Catania in Sicily. So I have two elements in one. And sometimes it's a real place and sometimes it is studio. There is one remarkable trick which I've learned, because only this experience you learn. They, they, the architect knew it from, from the very beginning. That when I had a view from the window in my, in my set, in the studio, I have all the roofs in one, in one direction. And while, when I, while I'm looking from behind the roofs, the roofs turn around and the same space is fulfilled by these houses seen, seen from the opposite direction. This is a very simple trick. And I was amazed how easily my city was turning around, just five people, and in half an hour it was a new view. But it's a minor thing. The major thing was that I could have had lighting that in real place was totally impossible because I had sunshine in a very deep apartment, what meant that the sun is low, and when the sun is low it means this either sunrise or sunset. And in fact, in films you buy it as a daytime. It's not realistic, but no spectator will ever, I hope, notice that this light is artificial. And when I was shooting the film, I decided I will shoot the set as it is seen from the backstage. Because if I do it, I will give an impression that this is born as a, as a stage play, it is artificial. I want to destroy the illusion. Later on, people forget this beginning. But at the beginning, I make it clear, don't look for real life. It is all constructed. It is literature. It is film. It is not life as such. And that's why I exposed also under the credits my favorite set. The society has changed dramatically. And films of this trend of this movement of moral anxiety, they were created on the premise that we questioned the real, the way how official ideology was implemented. Because we wanted to say, even if this ideology is promising something good, it produces something deeply evil. So there was one point that was uniting us. Today, we have various dreams because we have various visions of the desirable situation of the society which, that we would like to see. So we are not so united as we were because in protest you are naturally united. And now in a period of normality, and fortunately or not we are now having more normal life, there is no unity. We mostly disagree about our dreams. Some people want to see such Poland and some other people want to see totally different Poland. Some people want to see Poland totally merged with the rest of Europe. Some people say, no, we have to accentuate our difference. Some people want to have Poland more liberal. Some others want to have it more conservative. Some others want to have more state present in our life. And some others say, no, we want less state. So there is no such unity. But there is a regular criticism of moral, moral, lack of moral integrity in our public and private life. This is a legacy that is continued, no doubt. And I think we have, up to now, rather healthy continuation between our generations. There are permanently attempts to break this continuation. There are people who believe that they will go farther when they accentuate the generation fight. 
But as history of humanity is teaching us, the generation is something that doesn't last very long. In each generation, I feel I have allies and I have enemies. In my own generation and in younger generation. So this maturity means you have other links, not the generational links. You like people who are idealist and you don't like people who are selfish egoists. Doesn't matter in which generation. So people who try to create a generation fight, and some politicians try to do it, also in cultural politics, there are attempts to bank on generation conflict. I think they are basically wrong, and up to now they don't succeed. Because in each generation you have a certain amount of conformists, of people with no integrity, of no integrity, and there are people who are similar in various generations who fight against our degradation, moral, spiritual, aesthetical degradation. So on all these levels, I think new Polish cinema is doing well. I like many films made by young filmmakers, and I don't feel that they are alien to me, and some films made by people of my generation are absolutely alien to me, and I think the young people should feel the same. It doesn't matter what is the age, but it does matter what is the approach to life, what do you express in your film. In other words, whom you want to please. And I don't want to quote names. There is a big bunch of young filmmakers who make marvelous films. And I fall heartedly with them. And this is, there are some others who make trash become rich. I don't mind if they want to become rich and make trash and find the consumer, let them do it. That's their business. But I will be always trying to convert, con persuade people not to consume trash. But I do the same with McDonald's. I hope nobody is representing McDonald's in this company. But I always try to warn people because I was working for McDonald's 60 years ago and I signed a paper in London that I'm not going to tell the secrets of McDonald's, but I know them. I know how these hamburgers, what they are made of. And I never go to McDonald's in my life. So, if you want to produce trash food, that's your business. If you want to produce trash films, trash television, it's your freedom. But if you want to contribute something to humanity, to our development, to other people, if you want to help them to have more dignified life, culture is dignity, then you have something in common. And I think in Polish cinema you have various manifestations. I haven't seen the film of Mr. Kolski that is shown here, but I presume knowing the author that he is trying to make a serious cinema, applying to more demanding audience. And I know there was a, a comedy shown here that was probably popular with the audience. And it's probably the film I'm not going to see because I'm not that interested in share entertainment. Mm -hmm. Unless it is entertainment on the level of Charlie Chaplin, who was a genius and was making a film, films addressed to the largest audiences and was able to satisfy most sophisticated audiences, and Albert Einstein was one of his fans. I would always like to please Albert Einstein, and I care more about his applauses than applauses of big, numerous audience that doesn't care and doesn't demand very much. And this is a permanent conflict. We want to be applauded, but it is not indifferent who is applauding us. It is absolutely the same for the box office, who bought the ticket, who paid the entrance. But it's not indifferent to me whom I have pleased. If I please the people, some people who have sophisticated taste and high demands, I feel really honored. I want to dialogue with them. And some other people don't care. They want 
to talk to the very unsophisticated audience. But again, sophistication is not a question of education, to some extent only. But among very simple people, I sometimes find very devoted viewers. And recently, I had my retrospective of my films in one of the Polish prisons. So I th thought immediately that they want to punish the prisoners, and that's why they screen my films. But when I met this, the, the, the prisoners and I asked them, is this the case? Are you subject of persecution? They said no, and they were very simple minded. They said, we are about to leave the prison. We are now eager to see films that show real life. We were watching in prison occasionally entertaining films during long years of our sentence. But now we are about to confront reality, so we want to see real films. And it was our initiative. We wanted to have sophisticated films. Not because they are artistically complicated. None of my films is not accessible to simple viewer. It's only the question of what kind of interest he has. And simple viewer may ask the same basic, substantial, existential questions about his existence, his happiness, his future. And they want to address him and not the bank manager who wants to be entertained because he is tired after his long work. This man is not my audience, and he may be well educated, but he is not a person I can find common language with. So, I am rather confident that we managed to create a new generation of filmmakers who continue what we were doing, and we were continuing what our older colleagues were doing. We have our phenomenal master, Andrei Vaida, who continues to make films, being in his advanced 80s. I hope he will follow footsteps of Manuel de Oliveira, who is 102, if not 103, and still makes films. But Vaida is making <coughs> valuable films. And of course, some silly critics try to create a counterposition, say Vaida is not good anymore. Public doesn't listen to them. Public has followed latest films of Vaida. And I hope they will follow his biography of our ex-president Bawensa that he is shooting now. And I'm very happy he does it. I'm happy with that because I wouldn't be able to make such a film. But I think he has such a good ear to the history and to the time that this film will be of some, of some meaning. And I hope that in Czech Republic you have a good chance to make a real good film about Václav Havel. And I will be the first that would like to buy a ticket and see it. Well, yes. Yeah, actually, I have two questions for you. you know, we started to discuss you know, the possibilities of different point of view or shooting of the movies. You turn so lot, we are discussing with the young people, mostly on the film schools, you know, what their ideas, the future of the shooting, their movies. Where do you feel now at this moment some possibilities for this kind of the movies what we are talking about today? In what, what country actually we can see the possibility of women to the right by it? I think the biggest potential now is in Asia. I hold a master class in Pusan. Last year, I will be there again this year. I'm amazed what Asian directors bring me as their projects and what kind of problems they are facing. These problems are usually, if I may generalize, far more real than propositions I'm getting from European young filmmakers. In Asian cinema, from various countries, was Asian Academy of Films. So I had students from Filipino, from Philippines, from Birma, from many other countries of Asia. And they are all very concerned about real life. And they use very sophisticated poetical language at the same time. As an exercise, they made a beautiful film about a man who is death. He is angel of death. And he falls in love with a dying girl and because he is so attracted to her, 
he is late to other people and they cannot die and they get angry. They wait for him. Amazing story, but very full of meaning. It is not, it was not a light film. Another story they have brought to me about a boy who is split between his demanding girlfriend and his sick father. And he cannot find balance between two of them. These two of them want his life, love and try to tear him apart. This is a real drama. I believed it. I thought it came from life. And that is my feeling. I lecture quite regularly in China. I am amazed, however, there is a Chinese war and I am not able by no means to curse it. I see they don't understand me, I don't understand them. But the works they present and problems they leave, they're real problems. However, the destruction, spiritual destruction of a cultural revolution is bigger than I could ever imagine. And one of the most surprising questions was after my long seminar that one of the students took me aside and didn't want to have any witness and ask me the question, did he get me right? Because he understands that I'm saying that in life there are things bigger than money. How could it be? Money is the only thing that, that comes, and everybody says so. Then I understood that Mao made more, did more damage to China than I expected. But they want to find something else. It's not true. Human nature is always surprising us and is reviving.